Well, it's a great honour to interview you today, Mike. Um, we've known each other for nearly a, a decade. Uh, would you mind just telling us a little bit about yourself and your role at, at BSMS? Well, thanks, uh, Max. You know, I, I nearly started off by saying you're, you're perhaps in the wrong job because you're, you know, you sound like one of these, uh, you know, sort of media experts, you know, and so on. But, but, but thanks so much for, for sort of chatting to me this afternoon. So I'm Michael Corey. I'm um, a, a clinical academic. and Essentially, a clinical academic is a a, a medic or, or healthcare professional who also has an academic role. So um, I've also been at BSMS for nearly 10 years. And uh, you know, I am from a, you know, my job is in two parts. It, it's got the clinical aspect, so the healthcare delivery aspect and the academic aspect. Now the healthcare delivery aspect is um, essentially uh, patient care. So direct uh, patient care. And uh, I, I work as a consultant, a consultant physician. And what that means is that I'm a specialist in a particular specialty known as uh, clinical pharmacology and therapeutics. Um, so what that means in very simple terms, as I say to you often, Max, it's a doctor who is supposed to know a lot about medicines. <laughs> so I, I, I also um, you know, work as a specialist in hypertension. So you know, elevated blood pressure. I run a clinical service uh, in Brighton and now uh, recently Hay Haywards Heath. And I also look after general uh, medical inpatients in, in, in these hospitals as well. Now, in terms of academic uh, roles, uh, they're, they're again twofold. I, I, um, I, I'm a, a teacher, so I, I have a, an education role, uh, which is uh, undergraduate, uh, mainly in BSMS, but also in both universities, Sussex and, and Brighton, but uh, also cuts across a few other you know, universities that you know, I don't think is appropriate to actually name here. Um, I'm also involved in postgraduate uh, education uh, at BSMS and uh, as part of uh, an examiner in the, the Royal College. I also um, help uh, with uh, a professional exam, well, is it, is it prescribing safety assessment, which is a national exam that uh, newly qualified doctors have to take to ensure that they're sort of safe to prescribe. I'm involved in that. And uh, also, you know, work uh, as, a, as an external examiner uh, in the past to medical schools and, and actually some to, to pharmacy schools. So, so that, that, that essentially is in a nutshell what I do. Um, I introduced by saying I, I belong to a specialty known as clinical pharmacology and therapeutics. So doctors are meant to know a, a lot about drugs. So part of my role in, in the NHS, in healthcare delivery, is to, is to ensure that um, there is a safe, uh, you know, effective and responsible use of medicines. And as a result of that, I'm, I'm involved in, you know, sort of selecting medicines, procedures that lead to uh, the use of medicines in practice and so on and so forth. So I've got quite a varied role and, uh, you know, it, it, it does get me out of bed. It's quite exciting. Great. Thanks very much. Well, I'm hoping we can talk more later on ab about that, in particular, um, you know, broadly about hypertension. Mm. But can I ask you more about um, BSMS? What do you most most enjoy about working here at BSMS? Yeah. So BSMS is, uh, you know, so I... I, I you know, I, I, I think maybe I, I should go back a bit. So b before BSMS, I, I was in, in, in London, uh, you know, I was at, uh, you know, sort of UCLA, UCL. Um, and the attraction to BSMS uh, uh, for me was the fact that it's a, you know, it's a smaller medical school. And uh, you, you, <laughs> this might sound really strange, uh, you're allowed to do what you like. So, so, and I don't mean that in a bad way. You know, I, I'm saying that looking at the the dean of the medical school, Malcolm. Um, what, essentially, what, what what that means is you are that there are a lot of uh, um, like-minded individuals who are forward thinking. So, so obviously, to be forward thinking, you've got to be willing to take risks. So, at, at BSMS, uh, you know, uh, thankfully, we are able to take risks. And, uh, you know, it is only by taking risks that you're able to make things better. Because if not, you'll stagnate doing the same old things, you know. So, so that's probably what I enjoy most. I, I like the feel of it. You know, people are very friendly. 
Um, it's in a, a, a lovely part of the country, uh, you know, so Brighton, very coastal, you know, quite convenient during the summer. Um, so, so uh, you know, that, that, those are the uh, sorts of things that I, over time, have got to know more about in, in terms of BSMS and is a great uh, attraction to me. And could you tell us a bit more about your teaching at BSMS? I mean, I know a lot about it because you kindly have always taught on the GP part of the curriculum, which I'm involved with. Um, but just tell us a bit more about your teaching and you know an approach to it, and uh, yeah, a bit more about that. Yeah, so uh, teaching is uh, something that uh, I enjoy. You know, it's uh, you know, I mean, teaching and me, it's uh, it's a very enjoyable aspect of my my role. Um, I, I'm one of those few um, academics who's able to teach in every single year group. Uh, so I have contact with every single year group in the whole five years of the medical program. You know, so. That, that doesn't mean that I do all the teaching, but I, I, I essentially have contact with every single year group. So I, I can, if you like, uh, follow what the student does on, on the very first day up until they graduate. You know, so I'm able to say, well, actually, you're in year three. I know what you did in second year and I know what you did in first year. I know where you're going in fourth year and fifth year. And, and because of the nature of the specialty, it, it does entail working with a lot of others. You, you've um, cited the example of working in general practice, you know, so a lot of, uh, you know, sort of, um, the prescribing happens in general practice, so the use of medicines. And, and Max, just before I forget, just, a, you know, a, a unique selling point of mine is um, that um, it, one of the most common uh, patient facing actions or interventions, as we call them, is uh, prescribing of medicines. So, uh, wow. you know, it, it, it's that important. It's that important. So, it, you know, as a patient in the NHS, you're more likely to have received medicine than any other procedure or treatment procedure, uh, um, you know, sort of known. So it, it is quite important. It, it enables me to interact with um, a variety of professionals. Um, as I said, you know, I, I sort of have contact at every level and I'm able to look at the programme and if you like, map out exactly where, where, where the journey for, for, particularly for undergraduate, where the student starts till when they graduate and even beyond, I'm still involved, you know, so it's quite a, quite a nice uh, sort of feeling to have. Oh, good. And I know we have some ex-students on the line. It's great to have them back signing in. Um, I know some from quite far. So what do you think the take home points are from your, contrib your contributions to teaching, to the curriculum, that you hope that students, when they leave BSMS, will take with them into the NHS and for the rest of their careers? Yeah, so I, I think I try to get across that, um, that, that the medical uh, degree, or, or if you like, the practice of uh, clinical medicine, is a continuous process. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't just stop at one level. So even after you've graduated, you know, whether it's a, you know, a medical degree or a nursing degree, as long as you're a healthcare professional, the, the, it continues. Um, it's not a situation whereby, you know, I've, I'm done with this degree now and now I can move on to other things. It's actually a continuum. So it continues, uh, you know, into postgraduate studies. And actually beyond that, even when you, you think you've got to the peak of your career, you will continue to learn it in terms of continuing uh, professional development. So, so it is a continuum, it carries on. And each time, I, you know, I'm sure the students, the oldest students who have graduated will remember me showing you know, um, a particular slide, trying to sort of reiterate the fact that I, I know where they're going uh, and where they've come from in terms of the, uh, you know, sort of the degree. But that's essentially, you know, a, an overarching message. You never stop learning. Great, thank you. Now you mentioned um, your time at UC UCL, University mm -hmm. College London and the hospital there. Could you tell us a bit more about your journey towards um, BSMS? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, about, about, about your life journey. Okay, my life journey. Gosh, Max, that was a long time ago now, but I, I will try. <laughs> But um, so um, I, I um, my parents were immigrants, um, you know, immigrants from Nigeria, and uh, they they actually came to the United Kingdom individually, and uh, you know eventually met here, and then you know I, I I was born. You know they left Nigeria 
at a time uh, of, of um, civil war. Um, they weren't targeted specifically, but because of the instability, and you know, these are my, my parents have very, very humble beginnings. There was an opportunity for each of them, you know, in their different, you know, sorts of paths, and they ended up in the United Kingdom. So that's, uh, uh, you know, how, uh, you know, my journey began because, you know, they then met and, and, and then, you know, I, I, I was born. Um, I, uh, they, they came as students and uh, their, their overarching aim was to go back when things settled down. And, and they did that. So I was born in addition to three other siblings. And, uh, you know, we, in the early 80s, uh, we went back to Nigeria to, to, to live with, with my parents, you know. So they obviously, you know, that, you know, they, they were students here, they, they got uh, qualifications from here and, and went back to Nigeria in, in order to, you know, continue, you know, to, to contribute to that, I guess. And, and that was obviously home. So I, I, I did grow up in Nigeria. I, I, I grew up in Nigeria. I did my secondary education there. I, and my first degree is from a Nigerian university. So, um, of course, you know, it sounds really great. It sounds like a success story, but you know, Ni Nigeria wasn't easy. My, my dad was a lecturer uh, and uh, he, you know, at the time he was a lecturer, he was in academics, um, they, they, they weren't paying very well. Um, and my mum was into catering, you know, that's what she did uh, in, in the UK. So, so we were, we weren't, uh, you know, I mean, things were not that easy. It was quite, quite rough uh, at, at times. Uh, and so, you know, uh, the, you know, my coming here was to try and uh, after the my, my initial medical degree was to try and, uh, you know, if you like, um, pursue a, a postgraduate, uh, you know, sort of career and, uh, you know, sort of reduce any burden. And, you know, it wasn't just me who came eventually. My, my siblings also came, you know, back back to the UK. And that's to kind of lessen the burden, if you like, on, on you know, my, my parents. You know, that was the. Uh, original plan but you know obviously I'm, I'm still here today so um we uh I, I, you know I eventually came back uh, came came to the UK uh you know went into postgraduate training you know worked in you know different parts of the country the Midlands and, and other places and then ended up at UCL uh, where I was given an opportunity to pursue a specialist uh, you know training program in clinical pharmacology and therapeutics so uh, that's where I kind of grew up, uh, did, uh, you know, PhD as part of that uh, as well. And, uh, you know, when uh, uh, coming to, to, to uh, BSMS, uh, what happened was my, my wife was uh, on a GP training program and she happened to be on a GP training program in Kent, Surrey and Sussex. So uh, it, it was more convenient for us to move to Sussex. So, you know, looking for a we were living in Sussex for a period of time and I was going commuting to London. So after training, I uh, eventually looked for an opportunity here and, and there was one at BSMS. It was just very timely. And that's how I ended up in, in BSMS. Um, so, so that's, that's uh, you know, sort of the kind of, um, you know, journey to where I am right now. Thank you. And could you say a little bit about, you know, your ongoing links with Nigeria? how you maintain those links and perhaps what you most miss about yeah. um, times in Nigeria. Yeah. As soon as you said most miss, you know, I, I thought about food. That's terrible, isn't it? That's so, <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, interestingly, uh, Max, today, so my dad, uh, he, he died in um, 2019, just before the pandemic, you know, towards the end of that year. And his, his birthday w was the 26th of October. So that's quite interesting, isn't it? Wow. <laughs> which would have been today if he was still alive. So that's quite, quite interesting. Um, of course, um, I uh, have relatives and, and, and friends in Nigeria having grown up there. Um, I, I, you know, speak, uh, in addition to English, I try to speak. I, I, I speak uh, Igbo uh, um, fluently, which is a, a, a Nigerian language in the southeast part of Nigeria. And I also speak Pidgin English uh, quite fluently as well. You know, so I just thought I'd, I'd drop that in there, uh, you know, just uh, in case my English is not brilliant. You know, I, I do I do speak other languages, but um, I, I, we, you know, I, I, because I've grown up there, I, I have relatives, I have friends that I'm still in touch with. But, you know, talking about trying to maintain the links, you know, so obviously I have a family here in, in Sussex, you know, I have a wife and two teenage daughters. 
And uh, sometimes in summer, they, they describe our house as a, a bed and breakfast, <laughs> mainly because um, in summer, people who are able to, uh, relatives and friends, come visit. And we operate a very open door policy, literally open door policy. So we, we constantly have people coming in and, you know, the, at Nigerians, Africans, we, we kind of, um, it, your relative is almost everything, your relative or your friend, it, they don't need to give you too much notice to, to come visit you in their house, uh, but they will come and, uh, you know, you can't really say, refuse. So we do maintain links and when we have, you know, it's, it, um, we're able to, we, we go back to Nigeria and visit as well. So, so that's how we kind of maintain links. Of course, there's um, all sorts of um, social media and, uh, you know, the telephone, good old telephone as well. And you were going to say something, I think, something more about food? I was going to say something more about food. So, <laughs> so yes, uh, you, you know, when you mentioned what, what you miss most, well, it's the ability to have, uh, you know, a, a particular Nigerian dish um, whenever I want it. Now, now, that's not to say I don't have it in the UK. Uh, one of my favorite meals is um, something called um, eba uh, with uh, different kinds of soups, you know. So the two soups that come to mind is egusi and um, edikaiko. I'll explain that. So the eba is that actually, it's actually um, cassava uh, that's um, sort of blended, if you like, and, and dried out and made into, it's made into a kind of doughy meal. And that's used to eat uh, various kinds of soups. Um, which uh, which are quite tasty. I mean, Eddie Kaipo is a specialty. It's amazing. It's it's not actually from the part of the country I come from. It's from a neighbouring uh, sort of tribe, but it's uh, you know full of lots of vegetables, all sorts of things, and it's uh, delicious. So yes, that's not to say that I always I'm always eating. And and could you tell us a bit more about your life outside medicine? What other things do you do when you're not teaching? and not 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 caring for for patients in the nhs okay yeah it's a good good it's a good question uh, max so i um, i'm very much a family uh individual so you know my my time out is uh, spending it with um uh, family uh either acting as a well, taxi driver uh, ferrying you know one of my daughters to one thing or the other uh, or, you know, sort of just, uh, you know, sort of spending time, you know, actually doing nothing. Of course, the one meets with friends as well, um, you know, it, into into sports, uh, you know, as much as I, I can. Uh, used to play, um, but now support the best team in football, which is Arsenal, as you know. I just thought <laughs> I'd mention that, uh, you know, so, so uh, a lot of... Um, you know, I, I wouldn't say that I, I, I love any particular thing, but I'm able to, um, you know, sort of have downtime and, and spend a lot of that time with, with family and some friends. Great. Thanks very much. And if it's OK, it'd be quite nice to, to go back to some of the aspects of your of your clinical work. Um, and just talk about some of the things which you're in, involved in. Um, I know you. I know you've been involved because you you you, you talked to my uh, GP students about it. Something called MEC. I think. Mm. Could you say a little bit about that? Yeah. So so MEC is actually a national initiative. Uh, it's, uh, MEC stands for Make Every Contact Count, and it's essentially an organisational initiative to empower healthcare professionals to impact positively in, uh, on patients or members of the public at every contact. Now, I'll give you a typical example. You know, so I'm a specialist in hypertension, as you know, high blood pressure. And uh, I, uh, you know, what, one of the treatments for high blood pressure that uh, sometimes is underrated is, um, you know, sort of uh, lifestyle uh, measures. Um, and at, at every point in time, I'm a great believer that anyone who comes into contact with healthcare at all, it's an opportunity to give them lifestyle advice, you know, so, uh, you know, on, on their diet, you know, not to eat too much salt, or on, on, you know, sort of um, exercise, on, you know, the weight, and so on, general lifestyle advice, because it's got numerous benefits, you know, it's not just about high, hypertension that I'm interested in, but it reduces the risk of cancer, arthritis, you know, mental health uh, illnesses, you know, so it, it, it's a win-win situation. And, and it doesn't actually cost a lot, you know, this making every contact count. It's the ability to 
uh, point people in the right direction um, so that they, uh, you know, sort of look after their overall health, you know, because the, the emphasis now is on trying to prevent uh, people from being ill rather than going to treat. So, so that's the sort of initiative it actually is. Uh, thank you. And um, with regard to blood pressure, could you just say a little bit about, you know, the, the scale of high blood pressure as a health problem and perhaps a bit specifically about the black, uh, high blood pressure in black Africans? Yeah. So high, hypertension, essentially what that means in practice is uh, when the blood pressure goes up and stays up. In reality, uh, the normal uh, process is that the blood pressure goes up and down in your daily activities. But if the blood pressure goes up and stays up for a period of time, that's what we call hypertension. Now, the, 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 the issue with hypertension is that it's quite a, it's not an uncommon illness. We're talking about, you know, hypertension in one in four to one in five um, adults in the UK. And actually, if you get older, uh, it goes up, you know, such that, you know, we're talking about one in two, you know, if you're over 65, 70 years of age. So it's quite a common illness. And the problem with it is that uh, it, over time, very slowly, it does quite a bit of damage to blood vessels. Um, so these are, you know, sort of um, structures in the body that carry blood to various organs. And, 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 and some of these organs that can be affected by that uh, is the brain and the, and the heart. And so, so hypertension can invariably increase uh, the risk of having a stroke or a heart attack. Um, so it, it, it's, it's something, you know, where, you know, if it's controlled, we can actually do quite, quite a bit. Now, speaking about um, people of black African origin, and I, I'm one, um, that they have a higher sort of prevalence. It's more common in, in black Africans and is actually more severe. And the other thing I, I forgot to mention with um, hypertension is that uh, majority of patients, you know, eight to nine out of 10 patients, they don't feel anything. They don't feel any different. So they have no symptoms at all because generally someone like, like yourself as a GP, um, if I have a pain, um, I, I will come and see you because I have a, a specific complaint. With hypertension, majority of patients don't feel anything. So the only way of uh, sort of detecting it is to try and measure it, measure the blood pressure. So if people don't know to measure their blood pressures, what will happen is the damage continues very slowly and quietly until such a time when, you know, sufficient amount of damage is done and it causes heart attack or strokes. Now, it's more, more common in, in Black Africans. It, it's also more severe and, and, and much more difficult to treat. And, you know, I, I will just very briefly go over, you know, some perhaps some controversies around the treatment of hypertension in black Africans, because there are controversies around it. We, we do have uh, well-established pathways, you know, that um, empower healthcare professionals to be able to treat it. But um, when it comes to the treatment of uh, black African uh, patients, um, that there, is, um, there are some certain truths, you know, scientific truths around how they respond to some drugs. Um, so those are our are, are truths. But, you know, when we talk about black African and we talk about race, you know, sort of race based treatments, you know, as we know, race is a social construct, you know, and actually it's putting people together who perhaps look like each other, but genetically, and we know that the genetics plays a major role or biologically, they, they may be very, very different. In fact, there are some information out there to suggest that actually within the, the defined groups of, you know, of race, there's more variation in, in, in genetics than actually between different races, actually. So the other thing uh, that uh, is uh, slightly controversial is that a lot of the treatments that we um, have available are uh, after they've been tested in clinical trials, you know, so they're tested in experiments in order to determine that they uh, work. The, the other problem is that they, um, that when you come to black Africans, uh, they're not uh, very well represented in, in a lot of these trials. So a lot of the information is, is extra, you know, you extrapolate and say, well, you know, it's probably going to be good. And that's not to say that, you know, there isn't any data, it's just that they're not very, it's just the problem that um, arises in looking at the information. The, the other thing is, uh, 
you know, I've just talked about race as a social construct. You know, is there a difference between how black Africans or people of black origin who live in Africa, is, is there going to be a difference in how they respond, uh, you know, when it compared to uh, black uh, individuals who live in America or in Europe, for instance? So those are things that, uh, you know, uh, questions that r remain unanswered. Um, it doesn't invalidate the treatments we have today, but uh, it just makes us uh, begin to ask questions as to, you know, whether we can make things better. You know, so the, the treatments we have today are quite effective, and thankfully, and it's made a huge, huge difference, you know, whether w whatever your, your race or racial origin um, but, you know, it's um, people are beginning to look at this um, to, to determine whether there is a, a better way of approaching it. So th those are the controversies, um, you know, some of the controversies. Of course, when you think about, um, I'll stop talking in a minute, Max, <laughs> when you think about uh, um, uh, COVID-19 and how it impacted, um, you know, sort of significantly people of black and minority ethnic origin, um, it, you know, it, it's important that, um, you know, other factors are taken into account. That may mean that um, um, that might be the reason why, you know, the, the effectiveness of the treatment is um, not, not as good. So things like socioeconomic class and, and, and so on, sociocultural factors. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's a much bigger issue and, and needs a bit of unpicking. Um, but suffice it to say that we, we do have treatments uh, that exist today, and thankfully they are quite effective in, in the treatment of um, hypertension. Thank you. And um, I mean, as, as a GP, I mean, it feels very much that for all uh, people with high blood pressure, the primary challenge is identif identifying cases. Um, and I was just wondering if you had any thoughts, um, given that, you know, we have online people from all walks of medicine and life, um, you know, just any thoughts about how best we can reach out to, uh, to find those cases, particularly in Black African communities? Mm. No, that's a great question, uh, Max, you know, so it, it, it shouldn't be a one size fits all. Now, for, for the fact that, uh, you know, someone's come in from Africa or Asia or any other part of the world into the United Kingdom, that there are certain, you know, sort of um, so, social cultural behaviors. Now that that needs to be studied, uh, that needs to be, uh, you know, sort of uh, looked into so that we can communicate with people. Because what tends to happen is if you have a one size fits all, you 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 leave some people behind. So I, I think I think everyone needs to have an understanding that. Um, the, the you know people have got different perspectives depending on their you know sort of um social cultural sort of backgrounds and so on and and you know i think i think we we, we do need to respect that and uh, rather than see it as a an, a problem see it as a an opportunity to be able to reach some of these hard to reach uh, individuals because you know we, we've just uh, said how uh, the prevalence of hypertension is higher in the black, uh, you know, sort of population, and, and it's more difficult to treat. They have much more severe hi hypertension. So if we're, if we're not, um, you know, sort of seeking out these individuals and, and we're sort of, uh, you know, sort of utilizing conventional methods of trying to reach them, it, it may disadvantage them a great deal. So I, I think it's that, you know, I mean, we, we just need to be open we need to respect everyone, you know, all of us, you know, not, it's not, it's not a black problem. Let, let's put it that way. It, it is an everybody problem. And we just need to make sure we don't leave um, anyone behind. Um, for the fact that your English is not good is not an excuse. For the fact that you're not, uh, you know, linked into social media is not an excuse. For the fact that you can't afford, you know, certain things is not an excuse. And I, I think it, it's, it's something we, we just need to bear in mind and, and it's an it's an everybody issue. Great thanks very much that's really important and um, I know we've talked about this before that you're not Brighton's first black hypertension researcher. Um, we've done some work on this before and I was hoping you might say a little bit about uh, Frederick Akbar Mohammed. Well, thanks, uh, uh, Max. You know, so my 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 claim to fame is that. Uh, so, uh, before I tell you a bit about Frederick Akbar Mohammed, uh, Mohammed, 
Um, my claim to fame is that I work in uh, Royal Sussex County Hospital, in addition to the Haywards Heath Hospital. And uh, th this chap you've just mentioned, uh, Frederick um, Atba at Mohammed, he, he was a, a, when he was 18 years of age, he worked in this same hospital, in, in the Royal Sussex County Hospital. And he, he was um, the son of a, a, an immigrant. And actually his um, father and grandfather were at, into, very much into health. I think his, um, his father was into, owned a gym in Brighton. This was in the 19th century. And his grandfather was into, you know, sort of, um, I think, shampoo. He, he developed shampoo that um, one of the kings or, or two of the kings used, you know. And, you know, this is someone who traveled all the way from India, you know, so an immigrant. So traveled, uh, got got to Europe, and uh, you know, you know, his, his offspring, if you like, um, have uh, developed, um, you know, the way we see hypertension. Anyway, back to uh, um, uh, Frederick. So Frederick was a uh, you know very bright uh, medical student at the time uh, at the Royal Sussex County Hospital, and to cut a long story short, he eventually contributed to the knowledge of us being able to measure blood pressure by means of numbers. So in the old days, it wasn't the case, but he, he did a lot of research and ended up in London and various other places and contributed significantly to um, something called the sphygmograph, uh, which led to the, blood, the development of blood pressure machines that we have today. So uh, this is a, you know, someone who uh, was a second or third generation immigrant who uh, did, uh, did quite a lot. And, uh, you know, each time I think of myself at the Royal, when I'm doing a clinic at the Royal Sussex County Hospital, um, you know, it, it, he crosses my mind. And I, I think, well, you know, this guy was great and contributed a lot. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't think he's actually given enough credit for what uh, he's contributed. When you look at um, the, the luminaries of um, hypertension in the hypertension field, um, he, he does come up, but, you know, comes up eventually, if you see what I mean. But he's played a crucial role in, in, in you know, putting numbers to for us to be able to measure blood pressure and also did some, some uh, you know, work uh, trying to establish that uh, one of the effects of blood pressure is that it can affect the kidneys. In the old days, everyone thought that uh, the kidneys um, were responsible for everything to do with uh, blood pressure, hypertension. But he then discovered that actually it's not necessarily just the kidneys but um having hypertension due to any other cause or or, or uh, uh, no established cause can lead to can affect how the kidneys work yes thank you very much yes i'm saying i think we could do more to remember him both at the county hospital and 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 at bsms great thank you mike um in a minute i'm going to throw the uh mm. the session open to questions uh, but before we do that, I was just wondering, just sort of reflecting on your life, if you might tell tell us a little bit about one sort of high point and maybe one low point, one part that's been a struggle, um, and then we'll perhaps we'll go to some questions. Yeah, I'll start with a high point because that's usually easier, isn't it? So um, what, one thing I, I, I didn't mention is, uh, and I'm sure pe people know this, is that, you know, I was, uh, you know, made a professor, you know, just over a year ago now. And, uh, you know, that's like the, the peak of the academic career. So, you know, who would have thought? Um, but that's a joke. Who would have thought? But, you know, I, I you know, got to the peak of, uh, you know, my academic career. But obviously the work doesn't stop there because some people think you become a professor and then you retire. Um, it, it's just the beginning, actually. Uh, and you're doing much more. So that's uh, that's definitely a high. It wasn't just a high for me, but my my whole family, you know, my, my wife and two daughters, you know, so these are people who've egged me on, um, you know, right from the word go. So, I, you know, I think that that's definitely a high um, and, uh, you know, major achievement. And, you know, I mean, it's at places like BSMS that you can achieve such, you know. So if you think about, you know, where I'm coming from, my background, it's only at places like BSMS that this can happen, really, in reality. That's the truth. A low point. Um, a low point, I think, was um, I think when my 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 dad died. You know, that was because um, it was a brief illness. You know, th these things happen. He was um, someone I looked up to. He taught me to respect people for for who they are. You know, it doesn't matter what they have or what they can do. He, he taught me to respect every individual, no matter who who you know what happened. So he he, he is quite 
quite a coincidence that this is his birthday today. Well, it would have been his birthday, the 26th of October, and we're, we're having this talk. But that was a that was a low point. That was a very low point. It was um, kind of unexpected. Um, but obviously, you know, um, you know, I'm sure, you know, we have uh, great memories together and, and so on. Uh, but but yes. Thank you, Mike. Yes, I remember that. I remember that time a few years ago. Yeah. Well, thanks very much, Mike. What I'd like to do is um, to open the open to the floor.